worthy. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. And he is worthy to be praised. And isn't it great to just be a part of what he's doing? He is working. He is moving. He is ministering the world today. We just, I don't know if Brother Tim shared much, but we got back from our uh, annual couples marriage retreat, and it was just phenomenal. I mean, it was just, uh, go ahead and praise the Lord, wasn't it glorious? Uh, I just hope you feel real bad for not being there. It was so good, you know. <laughs> it really was an exceptional time in the Lord. And uh, I tell you what, uh, anyway, next year, you just don't want to miss it. It's, uh, it was uh, a hallelujah time, to put it the best words I can. It was a genuine hallelujah time to see what God did and how God moved. And, you know, I uh, started to talk to the, the owner of the Casa del Mar afterwards. He said, if you want to come back, we sure hope you guys come back. It was great having you here. I said, your problem is the room is, just, you know, we, we crammed 120 some odd, 30 people in there. And uh, it was uh, getting a little tight with that and may be able to put a few more people in there. I said, I don't know if we can do that. And I have to go to two weeks all of a sudden all again just because we can't get people in the room. He said, well, we just, he said, I destroyed our church. He said, I go to church and we're just rebuilding. He said, this seat's about 400. It should be done by next year. And I said, so uh, maybe we can talk about that. He said, you can, you're welcome to use the church, you know, for your meeting times. Now, I'm sure it's good business, man. He might have a little cash attached to that, but <laughs> we'll see how Christian he is once we get down there next year, amen. But praise the Lord. It's, it's make plans. We'll have the dates. We'll be working on those here soon as, as staff. We try to have those at least, you know, eight, nine months ahead of time so people can begin to plan for it. But uh, I was truly amazed at the turnout, at the blessing, at the glory that fell on that place and how just, uh, you know, just shared between our, you know, uh, Tim Ellis, Tim Strickland, both shared as well. And it was, they were, were anointed and God just blessed it and used it. What a great time the Lord it was. Make plans, amen. Uh, that we're not about just having meetings for the sake of meetings. We're about discipling the saints and certainly our homes are being a prototype of the church. We certainly need to have our homes manifesting the glory of God and that's what it really gets down to. Amen. We talk, continue about what God's doing in the world today. You ever stop to think about how just truly amazing we talk about the church and the glorious church, how truly amazing the church really is and how unique the church is. I mean, there's not another organization, another institution, uh, company, government, or entity involving human beings uh, in any way that is still functioning, committed to carrying out its founder's purpose uh, and the mandate that our founder gave us 2,000 years later. There's nothing that's ever been like that. I mean, the church alone has this distinction. There's no nation, there's no corporation, nothing has lasted like the church has, still committed to the original purposes and the founding principles that the Lord Jesus gave us. I mean, even Alexander the Great conquered the known world for the Greek empire at his time, but within a few years of his death, his kingdom was split among four of his generals. It was just, it was no longer there. The Roman Empire lasted longer than most nations had ever lasted to that time in history for several hundred years, but it's long gone and forgotten about except within the history books. Not so with the church. It's still alive, it's vibrant, it's powerful, and it can even be greater than what it is in present days if we just get a hold of what it's really all about. If we can discover what the church is here for and what God has called us to. Well, you want to discover that? I'm glad you're here today. We're continuing our series of messages on the glorious church. And the more I look at this, and the more I'm in Scripture, and the more I study, and even though I knew much of this already, it's just a refreshing revival, renewal about, hey, what we're really here for. I, I would honestly say, even in our own fellowship, that there's not a lot of people within the context of the, the regular folks who come and participate, even in ministry sometimes, I think that we really get the true purpose of, of what the church is all about and why we are here and how we can function most effectively to fulfill the purpose that God has called us to. The church is a glorious institution. To put it simply today, the purpose of the church is to be the completion of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do you mean? Well, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ came, and He is God. He's the, he's the, the Son in the Trinity. He came and put on human flesh. Born of a virgin, became a man. Deity clothed in flesh. That's what the incarnation is here. But what he came to do did not finish at his death and resurrection and his ascension into heaven. That was not the end. That was the beginning. 
And what he began is, is, it needs to be understood and needs to be clarified so that we don't miss what God is up to. Jesus made a real important declaration to the apostles and disciples before he was crucified. In fact, the night before. So, you know, everything Jesus was, was saying was extremely important. But, boy, think about those last words. He turned to the group and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Now, he didn't say they will be greater. He said the works will be greater. There's no way that we're ever going to be greater than the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are his, his body, and we are here for a purpose. And he made a, this important declaration to help people understand that, hey, this is just the beginning. You, you have witnessed and you have watched, you have seen what I have done, you've seen the great miraculous things that have happened, you've seen lives transformed, but I tell you, he said, you know, you're going to do greater things than that. How can that happen? How can we do greater things than the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, if you study history, you'll discover that we have done greater things and are able to do greater works because of the Holy Spirit has come to indwell and empower every believer. We are out there collectively as the body of Christ, doing the will of God. There is an impact being made on the whole planet by the church. And the more that we as the church realize who we are, what we're here for, our purpose, our mission, well, the more we're committed to Him and His call on our lives, then the greater the works will be. Jesus was on the planet. He was very limited. Even though He's God in the flesh, He's limited to location. One place. He never traveled more than a couple of hundred miles from his home. But we encompass the globe today. Even in those places where Christianity has been declared illegal and unlawful and the Bibles have been torched and burned, the church still remains alive. People are still coming to know Christ. Things are still happening for the glory of God around the world. We understand that God has called us and saved us, but it doesn't stop there. And what I want to do is, is break down the, the definition of this verse and what it means to us by going into scriptures and, and, and looking in the Bible. Specifically today, we're going to be looking in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. The whole book. In fact, we're going to kind of do an aerial view of the book of Ephesians to see what it really means for us to be the body of Christ and to understand, hey, how are we the completion of Christ and how can we do greater works than the Lord Jesus Christ? Because the Bible explains how this, this happens. In fact, every chapter of Ephesians reveals some way in which this happens. In that first part in Ephesians, there's that priestly prayer of the apostle, and he's praying for the church. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, he's, we look at these passages, and, and so we should. We have a tendency to look at them kind of, well, how do I say this? Individually. This is what God is saying to me. But we forget these passages specifically were written to the church. What is this saying to us? It's involving more than me. I move out of the realm of, of, uh, of isolation to realize that, hey, I am a part and I'm an integral part. I'm a, I, I belong to a larger group and a body called the, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. How often do we go uh, picking our way through Scripture to find what God is saying just to me and what I want and what I can get and how is this going to affect me and how is this going to make me better and how is this going to help me and how am I going to have victory, how am I going to prosper, how am I going to do this? And we, we kind of miss the mark of what much is being said here. And although, yes, God, we are saved as individuals, but we are birthed into a family. We're birthed into the family of God. And if we study Scripture, we realize that God, in birthing this church and putting us in His family... He put together this magnificent, supernatural creation called the mystery that had been hidden from the ages, which is the church. And he says, now I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless you with every spiritual blessing so you can succeed in what I've called you to succeed in. In fact, in Ephesians, there's about six ways that God has designed and equipped the local church to complete the very incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are the visible representation of who Jesus is on, on, on the planet. And again, I do not believe that a lot of people get the idea. It's about me instead of we. It's, it's about what I get instead of what, 
what, what the whole thing that is going on. So let's kind of do it. Brother Tim's doing an aerial view on Wednesday nights of Revelation. Let's do a, a quick aerial view of the book of Ephesians and see how that we are completion of the body of Christ and, and the incarnation of Jesus. First of all, we're completion of Christ's person. Paul ended Ephesians 1 by saying that the church is Christ's body, the fullness of all, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, here we are, we're the body of Christ, and he's the one who fills us all. And kind of back up what leads to that statement in chapter 1, uh, so, so you won't think I'm announcing some kind of heresy by implying that the Son of God is incomplete in his divine essence because he's not, you know, that, 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 that he needs us because he doesn't need us. He first tells us that, you know, Jesus Christ is God, he's complete, in his person, in him dwells the fullness of Godhead bodily, Colossians says, and uh, that, that, that he doesn't need us, but he has included us, and he's made us part of his body. In fact, Paul's favorite term in scriptures, he, as you see the Pauline epistles, is the word body. We are his body. The body's the, In fact, it's used more, more than any other word to picture the church and how it's designed to function in regard to Jesus Christ, who has ascended back to heaven. Scripture makes it clear though he's ascended to heaven, that we are his body. That's why Paul goes on to say, listen, in Ephesians chapter 1, I pray that the eyes of your, your understanding of your heart may be enlightened so you might know what is the, the, the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints, the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Paul is saying that this matter of understanding the church is so phenomenal it can be so mind-boggling that if he didn't pray for them to have understanding, they might not see the full picture of what's really going on with the body. This is a prayer that probably every pastor ought to be praying every day for his local fellowship, that we would get a grip, we would get an understanding, that we would know what the hope of the calling of God is, what are the riches of his, of his glories toward us, the, the inheritance in the saints, what's the surprising greatness uh, of his power that he's demonstrated for us, that we would understand the verse we read before about he's given us everything we need. Every spiritual blessing has been granted to the church, to us, the believers in Christ Jesus. Why does he give us every spiritual blessing? Why is Paul praying that our eyes would be open, our understanding would, would be increased? So we'd, we'd, get, we'd get on board with what God is doing. We'd understand that the church is, is unique, that it is a, a supernatural thing that God has established on the earth, and he has uniquely blessed it and, 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 and tied it to himself and linked it to his own heart. And he has given it designation, and he's given it, he's given it clarity, and he's given it mission, and he's given it purpose. And most of the time we don't see that. We, we look at churches, well, that, I, I need to go to church because, you know, I haven't been a good boy this week, perhaps, and so I can, I can confess my sins. Or I, I need to go to church because I need some inspiration for the rest of the week. Or I need to go to church because, you know, my friends are there. Or I need to go because I need a motivational lift this week. And we don't, we, we, that's our mindset. You know, it's, it's something I do on Sunday. Man, I don't have any idea what the church is about. I don't understand it. If that's, what I'm, if, if that's the way my perception is, it's, you know, I go, I do it, I do my thing, I'm a Christian, and that's, that's church is part of it. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible stretches far beyond that when it starts talking about how that we are the very body of Christ, and in Ephesians it says we've been blessed by God with every spiritual blessing, that we ultimately are the completion of His body. We are the very presence of Jesus on the earth today. That's His design. That's what God is, is, is telling us that we are. Now, there's some full, the full picture is He gets into Ephesians verse 19 and 22, spell it out, when He talks about, hey, that God raised up Jesus, and now Jesus sits where? In heavenly places, He's at the right hand of the Father. And that we, because we are in Jesus, we have a place there as well. And then he says, that now God raised Jesus up. It didn't stop there. He then put everything in subjection under Jesus. The Bible says he's gave him head over all things to the church. So Jesus has been raised by the Father, exalted to the right hand of the Father. He's now have been given to, to be the head over this massive body of believers, the church, and we have Jesus as a gift from God, as our head and as our Lord. And by the way, as it says before, he's the Lord over all things. That brings us back to where we started in verse 23, that the fullness of him who fills all in all. What does that mean? And what's the understanding? Jesus is complete in God, and he completes us. And he fills us. Why? Because we are his visible representation. We are the ones who carry out the mission. We need to understand that we're here to impact 
just as Jesus did, impact the world around us. So we need to consider the question a little bit before, before you get further. It says all things are under his feet because we look around and we kind of question that. We say, well, if all things are under Jesus' authority now, how in the world, how can the world be in such a mess and, and doesn't realize that Jesus is head over all things? Well, the short answer is all things that Jesus is over don't acknowledge his lordship yet. But nonetheless, he's Lord over all things. He sets his Lord today. We, on the other hand, as the church, you know, we have already acknowledged that. But one day, Paul wrote the Philippians will come when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Maybe, maybe, just maybe on that day, some of us will look back and say, oh, I get it. <laughs> That's what we're doing. That's what it's all about. Why didn't you say so? No, he's Lord over all things. We go now to the world and we represent his headship, his lordship, as the body of Christ. Now, this is part of God's plan because according to verse 22 of, the, of Ephesians there, you know, Jesus has been appointed his head over all things to the church. So he's, he's been appointed his head over the church. We are the church. By the way, let me clarify, those of you who know Jesus Christ personally, individually, as your Lord and Savior, you have been baptized into the body of Christ. You, upon salvation and regeneration, you are placed, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, into the body, baptized into the very body of Christ, and we become one with him. So now here we are, we're part of this grand body, and this is important, you know, because even though the world at large uh, you know, the all things of Ephesians there, they don't represent that all things are, are under his headship. They don't bow to Christ yet. But we have this responsibility to help and to teach and to instruct and to manifest that Jesus is Lord over all things. And that's what we're here for in so many ways. In fact, Peter wrote the church in 2 Peter, his second letter, he said, listen, God is patient. God is patient towards you, not wishing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, we know that means that God's been patient in sending Jesus to declare that lordship over all things, where every knee bows and every tongue is confessed, because there are those who need to repent. Now, that day of patience is about over, I believe, all right? That day is almost upon us. But he says, he doesn't say God is patient towards sinners there, does he? He says God is patient towards us, the church. We have a responsibility. It, it's a call for us to be what God's called us to be. It's a, it's a mandate for the church to understand who they are, what they've been called to, what they need to do, how they need to live their lives. So more people can be saved, obviously. But in other words, God's telling us we'd better get going on the job he's called us to do. We have a responsibility to fulfill. He's patiently waiting for the church to reach the world. That's the heartbeat there. Not for the sinner, but for the church. You need to get busy. I've been patient with you. You need to get out of your shells. You need to call out, crawl out of the can and get out where God has called you to be. We are the church, and every one of us, and every local church, and every Christian is important to what God has called us to do. When we say that the church is to complete the person of Christ, it goes without saying that no local church can fulfill that assignment perfectly. We're not perfect, and neither is any other church. But every church has been called to be a visible expression of that universal church. Every believer is a visible expression of the life of Jesus Christ to the world that's around us. That's why the strategy of Jesus is so brilliant. I mean, you think about what he's done and what he's put together, this entity called the church, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Uh, every time the church pronounces a, a benediction, let me go back to that, every time the church pronounces a benediction on Sunday and sends people out in the world, Jesus goes out into the world with them and in them to their offices, to their, to their work sites, to the schools, all across the world, all right, every city. If his body is there and they're going out and obeying his direction, living their lives for him, then they're seeing the visible reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. We become that image, not only as individuals, but as a collective group. It's glorious. And that's the amazing part about the church is we go through this and we see, first of all, we are the completion. It's our purpose. We are the completion of the very presence of Christ. Following that up is the completion of Christ's presence. We have his body. I mean, as Christ's body uh, completes his person on the earth, the church also becomes the completion of his presence on the earth. I mean, they're kind of related. It's obvious wherever the body is is where the person is. Amen. 
So, uh, in the old days, remember, we went to school. I don't know if they do this anymore. I haven't got everything so electronic. We'd sit in class, and the teacher would call names, call roll. And what did you do? You'd say, present. All right, they'd know, know that you were there for class. Well, when the role is called for Jesus' name in the world today, we ought to all be saying, if we're Christians, present, <laughs> because he's present in us, and he needs to be visibly seen through us, and he makes his, known, he makes his presence known in us in a very special way. He's called us to live this very special life. In fact, we are unique. We are a new kind of temple before the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you, if you go through the Bible in Ephesians, we take the arrow view. In one, you see the establishment of a body with Christ as the head over it. In chapter 2, it begins to build to a climax in verses 19 through 23 when he, he says these words as he opens up in those verses, and they're familiar with us, so we're not going to read through all of Ephesians today. This is an overview. He starts there in Ephesians 2 with us, you were once dead in your trespasses and sin, alienated from the life of God, under the wrath of God, those verses say. So he takes us from here's the glorious church, and then he starts with how we get there and what we do. It starts with us dead in our sins, and then he moves in that chapter about the grace of God, and he's made us alive in Christ Jesus through the grace that saves us. And then he keeps moving through that passage that we now become a visible representation of the grace of God, of the kindness of God, kind of like exhibit A. If you're in the courtroom, they bring out the exhibits to verify the testimony that's been given. God has a testimony that Jesus Christ is changing lives. I'm exhibit A. You're exhibit A. Amen? Your life, your transformed life, the difference you are, the light versus the darkness, the salt versus the nothingness, you're the, diff you're the ones who stand as a, as a testimony that there's a God in heaven who sent his son to save lost people, and you're one. Amen. You've been saved, and you've been redeemed, and your life has been changed. Then it brings us that classic statement of God's grace. You're saved by grace through faith, not of yourself, lest any man should boast. It's the work of the grace of God. Amen? And those are glorious passages. There's that beautiful statement. But then he brings us, he says, all believers now are one new body. You know, boy, you talk about wiping out mandates and distinctions and races and everything else. You know, I tell folks all the time, it ain't, it ain't, if you get saved, there ain't no race anymore but one. It's called a holy race. We're the family of God. We're the, it, it breaks down all isms and racisms and all the other things and distinctions that men try to capsulize themselves in and identify themselves with too. We now have a new identity. We've been brought into a new family. We're unique. We're the people of God. You look around this room, I don't care where you're from, what distinction, what class, what, what order, what, what wealth factor, what lack of wealth factor. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're the family of God. Somebody ought to praise the Lord on that. That's the holy family of God. Hey, you, you, hey, you, you can't get over that. You might not make it to heaven. Hey, Amen? If you don't understand that, I don't know if you understand the grace of God. You have some way, you perhaps think you're a little better than other people. You come to the cross, that ground's all level, man. Everybody's equally lost without Christ. And here's the beauty of it. When we do come to him, we complete his person. We become that new creation in Christ Jesus, this distinct body. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, built up on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, whose chief cornerstone is Jesus himself. We talked about that last week. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you had your being built together into a dwelling of God and the Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, we had the temple. Where was the temple? That's where the presence of God was, remember? I mean, when they built the temple, even the tabernacle was finished, the glory of God came down, and it filled that holy, holy of the temple, of tabernacle. But later, when, under Solomon, when the, when the temple was built, and the holy God came down and inhabited that place, there was a fire by day and a cloud by night as they wandered. Listen, we now are the holy temple. We where the glory of God resides. We have in us Christ, the hope of glory. He lives in us. That Shekinah glory of God now fills our hearts and fills our lives as we are unified. We carry it out to the world. 
We are that moving temple that goes out and makes a difference in the world around us. And we need to realize that, especially in the day and age that we live, is that we're taking Jesus' presence everywhere. That's what we're called to do. That wherever we go, Jesus is there. That wherever we are, we are manifesting the presence of Christ Jesus. We're part of His body. I know Christians gather for worship and buildings of worship and praise. We get some instruction in the Word of God and we're gathered there. And the presence of God is evidence. I mean, as we were worshiping that, the Lord on that last song, especially, but there's just people who are worshiping God. And the presence of the Lord just becomes so obvious as we meet in, in corporate worship like that. But the beauty of it is, folks, that we leave this place and we take His presence with us wherever we go. We're that human temple. God no longer limits Himself to a place on the earth with, made from building and wood and stones and, and precious jewels and stuff. A good illustration of that is like is in American embassies all around the world. The embassy, the American embassy, no matter what country you're in, if there's an embassy there, it's a little bit of America a long way from home. And there it is, it's, it, the soil in which it sits is foreign soil, but it's thoroughly American. That place is governed by American rules, American law, American land, American values. Wherever we go, it's the same way. We, therefore, are ambassadors for Christ, the Scripture says. That wherever I go is a little bit of heaven. The glorious presence of God goes with us. We are the completion of His presence on the earth, but we're also the completion of His plan. According to Ephesians 3, the next chapter, you know, the, the, the church is the culmination of God's plan for the ages and to demonstrate to the entire world and angelic realm His infinite wisdom, choosing weak vessels like us through which He can manifest His glory. Now, I talked a little bit about that last week. We talked about the, the hierarchy of angels and the archangels and Lucifer and what this beautiful angelic being that he was and how he rebelled against heaven and 30 angels left with him. But God came and created man and then he put his son on the earth, made in the fashion of a man, and he took the weakest vessel in creation, all right, which is mankind. And he glorified himself within that weak vessel. It wasn't the angels that he did it through. In fact, the Bible says the angels look on. They, want it, they don't get it all. That God would choose to fashion you in the image of his son, that he would come into our lives, make us new creatures, and then would give us authority. Though we're, the Bible says we're lower than the angels. We have more authority than the angels. And God takes us, and we become part of the plan, which, in, in fact, the church really is a surprise to the devil. Amen? The Bible says it's the mystery in Ephesians 3 that it's been hidden for the ages and now being revealed to the intent to the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. God's going to make His wisdom known. How? He's going to make His wisdom known through the church. That's the intention of God. To the rulers, to the authorities, and heavenly places. Who's He going to make His intention known? What God's plan for the ages is? I'm going to do it through weak human vessels. And I'm going to let the angels see just what this whole deal is really all about. What's he doing? And when we talked last week, and I'm not going back and rehearse that. If you didn't get it, we have it on DVD, and you can get it. But we talked about how that there was this angelic conflict, and God dropped us right in the middle of it to demonstrate his power and glory. Yes. And we're part of that. Man, if we could ever wake up and see that, it'd probably set ourselves on fire, and, and, and coaly fire, and we begin to rejoice. That mention of heavenly places gets us back to the place that he took an inferior creation, called mankind, and showed us off to demonstrate his power and authority to rulers and authorities and angelic beings. And that's both the holy angels that serve God and the unholy angels that are part of the servanthood of Satan. You need to understand that God, you know, the plan God set in motion to redeem fallen humans and call out people for his name, it culminates with the church. In fact, the Bible says it was a surprise to the devil. I mean, when Jesus dies on the cross, I'm sure Satan thought that's it. But when he's risen from the dead, I'm sure there was, uh-oh. And then on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes to actually, this is blow up my mind, actually inhabit humanity, the devil looks at the other demon and says, oops. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. <laughs> that God would manifest himself in the fallen human being. That can't happen because of sin. But somebody took care of the sin problem. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross and became sin. Now God can come because of that and come into our hearts and lives. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, if the rulers of this age, and it's talking about demons, understood what God was really up to, they wouldn't crucify the Lord of glory. 
So the church is the climax of God's plan and purpose that he set into motion. When? Back in eternity past. The church is God's way of saying to the whole angelic realm, this is the plan and the purpose I've been carrying out on the earth. This is what it's all about. This is what, we're, this is what I'm up to. And this is the beauty of it because ultimately God is dealing with the whole issue of that cosmic revolt and sin that began when Lucifer reared up himself and said, I'll be like God. That's what started that. But this is how God answers that and brings upon his own son to deal with this massive cosmic problem called sin and rebellion and pride. And he gives up his son. The church stirs up the angels. And I, if you go to lift group tonight, they'll talk more about that. Amen? Fourth, we're the completion of Christ's program. We complete the program of Christ that God planned out in, in eternity past. And this is where Ephesians starts talking about how that God had this plan. And you take Ephesians chapter 4 and be looking at it tonight in lift group chapters 4 verses 7 through 16. There's that powerful passage in there that, that teaches that every believer is gifted for service and that Christ has given, not only gifted the people for service, but has given to the church gifted people to lead it. In fact, the Bible puts it this way, to every one of us, grace has been given. The measure of Christ's gift. In other words, God, in this church, this supernatural thing, he's, he's resurrected and made himself head over by putting himself in all these people's lives, then uniting them as one, giving them structure and order. He's also given them every blessing they need to be what God's called them to be. And then he's gifted them within the church to fulfill his mission and purpose. Isn't that beautiful? In fact, there's no way that any of us at this point, after reading Ephesians 1, every spiritual blessing has been given to us, and then God's given me a gift for ministry, there's not one person here that's a Christian can actually say, I have an excuse for not being a minister. I, I have an excuse for not being a, a real representative of the Lord Jesus. I have an excuse for not being involved in my church body. You don't. There's no excuse. There's no place you can say, I, I'm just here to sit on the pew. There's no, I love what Tony Evans says, you know, if you come in our church like that, we consider that being a leech. <laughs> What's a leech do? It's parasitic. It just gives me this, give me that, tell me how to fix my home, tell me how to fix my problems, how to fix my finances, take care of this problem. I'm in the sick, I'm hospital, come visit me. You know, you know I had me in church, make sure I get a call or a note or a letter or something. Make sure you notice me. Never gives back, never is part of the whole function. Never is healthy for the whole body. It's just, it doesn't meet the biblical criteria. And in case you're a little worried about that, I didn't write this book. <laughs> I didn't write, it's not my idea. I'm not smart enough, and neither are you, to come up with this plan that God came up with to reach the world, to deal with the problem of sin, and to bring about holiness and righteousness back into all things. I mean, the Bible says in, that, that in, in chapter 4, it says, So Christ led captivity when he ascended on high. He led captive, a, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. It means he, he, he uses it, Paul uh, uses a, an Old Testament quotation, as a matter of fact, that verse 8 is. And verses 9 and 10 are added as an emphasis to what Paul was saying. And, and this passage answers the question to what happened between the time that Christ was dying on the cross and the time that he rose from the dead. He gives a little insight to what took place that he went into Sheol. Now, the Sheol was the place of the dead, all right? Heaven has not been opened up to, to the point of the crucifixion of Jesus. Men can't enter into the holy presence of God because they're unholy. So what we see in the New Testament is Sheol, or Abraham's bosom. Paradise has also been called. One side over here, Sheol, is, 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 is reserved for judgment. The other side are the saints, the Old Testament saints, who look forward to the day when the blood would be sacrificed and the, the altar would be made holy before God and our sins would be atoned for. So Jesus, he ascends during this time into Sheol, it says in Ephesians 4. He does two things. One, he goes into one side and, uh, you know, and tells the demons, you lose. Because that's not all demons, it's some demons. You read Jude, you read 2 Peter, you'll see there were some demons that God already assigned for judgment. That was down around the flood time and the pre-flood time and these certain demons were coming down and taking wives of, of, uh, of human beings, people. And you see about this cross breeding that takes place. God took all those demons that are guilty of that and locked them up. The others... On the other side, those who trusted God, who, who, loved, who loved the Lord, who surrendered their hearts to God. And what he does, he goes over that side and he says, I've got the keys, I'm unlocking this place, follow me. And it says he led captivity captive. In fact, the Bible says on that night in Jerusalem, many tombs were opened up. 
and there were Old Testament saints walking around the streets of Jerusalem. Now that's, you say, I don't get that, man. We can ask God about it later, all right? But paradise was moved from this place because it was just a temporary plan uh, for covering sin with blood of animals. That doesn't really deal with it. It just foreshadows what's to come. But those people had faith. And so now they've been reserved for heaven. The final payment for sin has been made, and he ushers them into glory. And in the process of completing this triumphal march, Jesus is authorized by the Father at this point to hand out gifts. He gives out gifts at this point. Now, this is beautiful because this is where we come into God's eternal purposes. In the process of overcoming and taking these saints in, he, in the, he follows up by giving out gifts to men. And it's that part of Ephesians 4 where it talks about how gifts were given. And the gift also includes gifted leaders and teachers for the church. And these leaders include pastors and, and, and teachers and evangelists. And they have the assignment for what? To equip the saints for the work of service for the building up the body of Christ. Now, this is why it's so important. We have a journey class, 101, 201, and 301, where we explain to anybody that wants to be a part of Believer's Fellowship what we're about, what we believe the Bible says the church is. Well, it seems to be very, very clear. It doesn't take some kind of private interpretation to get this. It's very clear. And we teach that it's important for us to be a part of a local assembly, a body of believers, if we're going to do what God has called us to do. You can't do it as a lone ranger. You can't do it in front of your TV watching Joel. You have to be a part of a fellowship. You need to be a part of a body, an active, integral, important part. There's no way around it. It's like somebody, you know, uh, walking up to somebody at lunch and saying, hey, what do you do? Well, I'm a pro football player. What team do you play for? Oh, I don't play for any team. <laughs> but you're not a pro football player, are you? you? You have to be involved and a part of a fellowship because God has gifted you for that. In those classes, during 101, 201, 301, we talk about these things and the importance and how to find your place and how to discover what those gifts are. And then what the responsibility of pastors and teachers within this body are. We're, we're, we're the equippers. If you really want to know the truth, the Bible says they are there for the equipping of the what? For what? For the... Let's say that again. For the work of service. Now, one more time. For the work of service. There's some folks in the hospital in our fellowship today whose responsibility is to go see those people. It's our responsibility as a body, isn't it? There's some folks who are without work, perhaps. Who's, who's, our, who's responsibility is to help them? They're part of our body. It's ours. There, there, there's some widow who can't get out and mow her yard and can't afford to have them. Whose responsibility is to help her? Our. Our. That got real quiet, didn't it? The only one that answered that was widows. <laughs> We're here for each other. We're here to reach the lost world. Whose responsibility is that? Preachers. No! It's your responsibility, and yes, it's all, we all do that ministry, but it's my responsibility to equip you for that. That's why we have conferences. That's why we have lift group. That's why we have discipleship. That's why we have one on one, two on three. We do all these things to equip you. And you know what we do, though? We come to church, we flip open the bulletin like it's a menu. I don't want to go to that. I don't need that. I don't like that. That's, you know, I got a football game. And you know what we do? We say, oh, I can't do that because we have volleyball at our house, and we got Boy Scouts here, and we got Girl Scouts here, and we got baseball here. And we, hey, if you put all those things before the church, that organization that you're a part of, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Brownies, and Fudge Cakes, or whatever they are, you know, they're not going to be here 100 years from now, right. 1,000 years from now. Right. We are. The Kiwanis ain't going to make it through the cycle of fire. Near the Rotary, the Lions are the Masons. It's the church. There's not one organization that you're a part of, and you may be part of a bunch of them, and I'm not saying they're not good organizations, but they should never take priority over the church. That's worth praising the Lord over. Ever. But we're playing Klein Oak. Join me, I'm facing the forces of hell. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We got a lot bigger scrimmage going on. A lot bigger front line working for us too. Amen. As the body of Christ. I know this isn't popular, but it's true. I know it's not fashionable, and I know it's not preached today. And that's why we're not doing and accomplishing as churches what God would have us to, to do. And I don't even believe our church gets the full picture. I, I don't. I believe we have a lot of people in our fellowship, they don't have any idea what's going on in regard to what we're here for and what God is up to. Jesus wants us to grow, though. He wants a mature church. The church can't operate like, like, like we do in so many ways because we have a too big a job to do. 
Every part of us has to function the way God wants us to. Every one of us are important to the overall functioning of the body of Christ, all right? The goal of Christ gifting to his body is what? That the body might grow up into full maturity to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. The flip side of that is we stop being an infantile body that's fighting or pushing or wanting our way or fussing or fuming or not liking something, you know? And we just miss it. I tell you, when we call a marriage retreat like we did, every one of you ought to be there that's married. Every one of you. Amen. Don't worry, you're forgiven, but you can be there next year. Amen. And you can bring somebody with you. And you can see transformed lives all happening all around you. We call men's retreats and women's retreats, those things, those are for, for us to be growing and maturing and discovering fellowship, relationship, functioning body of Christ, and then we go out from that as mature and strong force to be reckoned with in the angelic realm as well as the worldly realm. God's got some glorious things for our folks, and sometimes we just miss it because, well, I don't have to, I don't, I'm tired. We just miss what God's doing. But if we grow up in Christ and to the body that he's called us to be, complete and whole, then we are fitted, we're held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part because the growth of the body for the building of itself in love. What's he saying? He says, every body is important. Every one of us are part of a bigger body. And that healthy body builds itself up. And what happens is we are a healthy body that's working out and standing up and being what God's called us to be and going through the exercises of faith every day. Our body's stronger. You know what happens when you just become a couch potato? You know, you, you can't even ward off disease anymore in your body. You get sick every time somebody blows their nose around you. Amen? And a lot of we get so easily sick because we're just so out of shape and we don't take care of ourselves. And we eat garbage and live garbage. We don't get proper rest. We don't have proper priorities. Now it's really getting quiet, isn't it? <laughs> and what happens when our body does that? That's not the way it should be. The body begins to, it, it starts taking on infections easily. Rebel cells begin to, to replicate within our body. Soon a lump develops. There's a problem that needs to be cut out or dealt with, but a healthy body is not like that. It fights off those radical cells and rebel cells. It's supplying each other. We are ministering. We're strengthening. We're encouraging. We're, we're edifying. We're building each other up. Someone's out. We, we hurt for them. We don't wait for the preacher to call them. There's no way, folks. I, Sunday morning, I'm doing two services, and I'm freaking to probably 400 people or more. I can't, the lights are so bright I can't even see if you're here or not. Now, I probably shouldn't have said that because some of you just come to you think I'm looking at you. <laughs> oh, he's going to miss me if I'm not there. Be... That's why it's important for each of us to do what God's called us to do, to be a part of what God's called us to be a part of because we are so vital to it working. Each person is so vital and so important to supply to every joint to keep the blood flow going, to keep the right cells being produced. When an infection sets in, you know what the body does? God designed our body to immediately begin to fight that, doesn't he? Well, I tell you what, when an infection sets into a body of believers, we should be healthy enough to ward that off. Stand strong, be united, so we're not always over here fussing and fighting. We are obviously the completion of the body of Christ, but not only of his program, but we become a portrait to the world, an image that the world can see of this great and this awesome God that we have. He's entrusted us, the church, with this all-encompassing plan he's given us and the privilege of completing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an honor. That's a high calling that we've been called to. We shouldn't look at church as something we have to go do. I'm tired. I go to church. I wish I better do church. I won't feel bad today. It just ruined the football game for me if I feel bad. <laughs> church is what we are. You know, Paul discussed the relationship between wives and husbands in Ephesians. He had a lot larger purpose in mind when he talked about the mystery of one flesh, this mystery of a one flesh relationship, husband wife, which we spent a lot of time talking about this week. He said, but I'm speaking in reference to Christ and the church. He says it's important for a husband and wife to understand the unity and the harmony that they've been called to, that they're no longer two, they're one. He said, but how much more so for the church to realize that? We spent a lot of time this weekend talking about the plurality of our relationship as male and female. But the Bible says God made man in his image, male and female. In other words, you're not, as a man, complete without that wife there in regard to God's working in your life. You've taken a wife. You're, 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 you're going to be incomplete if you don't know how to relate to her. 
and how you, to nourish her and strengthen her. As a woman, if you have a husband, you're incomplete if you're not learning how to relate to him and minister to him and encourage him to obedience to Christ. So, so also is the church that same kind of functioning plurality of people. I said God made man in his image, male and female. Don't miss the context. What does it mean to be made in God's image? Male and female. We can't work without each other. The whole, the whole humankind quits operating if we move to homosexuality. No babies. <laughs> no functioning purpose. He didn't make them male and male, Adam and Steve. He made them male and female. So homosexuality is completely out of the order of what God intends. Completely against the image of God. He made them male and female. If we're going to succeed, we need to learn how who we are, but also within the body of Christ. We, we have a distorted picture I think the world gets so often, even a much distorted picture of marriage, because we know that what the Bible tells in a relationship, how a man and a wife are supposed to relate to each other. And that's that section of Ephesians, a part of the aerial view, where he likens the relationship of a husband and wife to Christ and the bride, which is given to the church, that the wife is responsible for that righteousness and submission in her life to, to submitting to her husband's leadership, just the way Christ submits to the leadership of the, the church of the Lord Jesus. Christ and the husband responsibility it's equally cumbersome because we are so independent and so selfish just as a woman might not want to submit to her husband a man doesn't want to do this love and cherish and be selfless and sacrificial we both have tremendous responsibilities fulfilled but also he says I'm relating to something much bigger than this I'm talking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ how much greater can you be when you learn how to operate with each other he wrote these words, though, as he wraps it all up finally. In this aerial view, be strong in the Lord, the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so you'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the, the, the world forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. He says, listen, we are in a big arena. Get back to the conflict we talked about last week. There's a spiritual conflict going on. There's something bigger than what most of us even can begin to comprehend. God is invoking His righteousness into the cosmos. He's come on to the scene to show what His holiness is like and what His power is like and what His awesome sovereignty is like. And so He's taken weak, fallen humans and moved into their very being by sending His Son to make a way for that to happen. And we now become possessed by deity, the very power of God. And then we become united. The Bible says after he raised him up, he put him as head over all of us. So we are united as one giant family and body, army. All those pictures are given. And then he gives us everything we need to stand within the context of this conflict because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We are told to stand firm. And it's repeated twice in verse 13 and 14 of that chapter in Ephesians. It says, stand firm, stand on the ground, God put you in. He didn't say, put on the whole armor of God, go fight a fight. No, you get dressed, you stand. In fact, it's important that when you get dressed and you put on the armor to stand because we're not out there going to fight. We fight, you know, but we're not fighting for a victory. I think that's what a lot of people think. We'll fight. No, we have victory. We're fighting from a position of victory. A lot of people say, I'm just trying to get the victory. If you're saved, you got it. Amen. Go get in it. Go stand in it. There's opposition. Stand where God wants you. How does the local church equip the members, the saints, to stand firm, to complete Christ's victory? By enabling the church to use the army that God's provided. You put on the whole armor of God. So we teach it. We preach it. We show you what it means to have those things. Roman soldiers had to put their armor on in a certain order so as to fit together properly and gave them the protection it was made to give them. You had to put it on the right armor. Joseph's here, and you can talk to him. He, he works in the arms room for, for his brigade. He's in that arms room, and he'll tell you that when the armor is put on, you know, you don't put your weapons clips under your vest, all right, under your... Under your, 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 your protection there. You keep those clips you give. You don't put your gun in your underwear. You, know, you have it out. <laughs> you, you're wearing it. You put it in the right place in the right order and the right thing at the right time so you can do what you need. That's what the church is here for, to instruct, to enable, to equip you for all those things so you know how to do and how to fight and how to stand. We're to put on the spiritual armor in a definite way. And he tells us now, with all praying and petition, praying at all times in the Spirit. That's what goes on. That's how the armor goes on. And that's how I stand firm, because it all comes back to this. Once the armor is all on, what do you do? You stand firm praying. Why I pray? Because that's where the battle is. 
That's where the Bible, as I go out in the world, I'm praying. As I'm talking to lost people, I'm praying. As I'm living in my life with my family, my children, my wife, I'm praying. Everything's being submitted to God's will. Everything's being submitted to, the, to what God's direction might be. If I choose to hear the words of Jesus, believe the words of Jesus, and pray those words of Jesus, live those words of Jesus, it says it doesn't matter what the wind, the rain, or floods might come, I'll be able to stand. So I trust God. Why? This is beautiful because I am the completion, not only of his presence and his program. I'm the, we're like a family portrait before the Lord, but we also are the very extension of the power of God. That's why God's given us authority. And there's a lot of stuff we can put in here and talk about, but that's why we decided to include this particular sermon series within our lift groups because there's a lot more to talk about here. I have 13 pages alone of notes here. I usually come to the pulpit with three or four pages. But there's so much more that we didn't even touch on your lift leaders have been preparing for to help you, to equip you in some of these areas and to go into further discussion of what they mean for your life. That's why it's important you come and be a part of our lift groups. You know, you're a part of the body. No, I'll just come to church here. You may come to church, but you're not doing church. And God's called us to do church, be church. That's what he's made us to be. It's what I am. It's what I've been created and recreated for. Now, just to get to heaven, I'm here to continue with you to be the very picture, portrait, program, plan, purpose, presence, power of God to the world around me. How's that working for you? <laughs> so, I don't know. That's not anything along my Christianity is. Make some adjustments in your life because you're missing out on a lot of fun. You're missing out on a lot of grace. You're missing out on a lot of blessing. Because there's nothing more important on the world today, in the world today, than us being what God's called us to be. And none of us do it by ourselves. That's why even when we have our leadership dinners, I talk to people and at different times, say, well, you may lead a Bible study, or you may lead this part of ministry, or you may be able to, but that's not, you just don't kind of compartmentalize that from the church. This is what I do. Everything you do is interrelated to the church. Amen. All right? Because sometimes we get people in a leadership role, and they don't think that everybody's paying attention to them, like that's what they're supposed to do. I'm supposed to pay attention to Jesus. And we're encouraging everybody to keep, whatever our role is, to keep moving towards Christ, to keep growing up in Christ, to keep maturing in Christ. There's a, I'll tell you honestly, that's not the kind of church people want today. A church that functions. A church that's structured. In fact, I hear a lot of people say, well, I just don't believe the structured church is, you know, the, it's, 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 it's the will of God. It's pastors and teachers and deacons. And all. You read your Bible. I had a lady after the service this morning at the other campus said, you know, I've got some friends who don't believe in, you know, what you're talking about. She said, she said what's a real good book I can give them? First and Second Timothy. <laughs> like some human author is going to have the final word on it. Yeah. First and Second Timothy works real good. All right? Read that one. If the Bible's not good far enough, some author from some publisher is not going to cut it either. But this is what the Bible says, folks. And I, as your pastor, want to be a faithful minister to be the gift to you, to encourage you, to persuade you, to convince you, even correct at times, if necessary, for us to be what God's called us to be. Don't you want to be a part of that kind of church to manifest the glory of God? I do. And I believe you do. First of all, you want to join the church? You've got to join Jesus. It's his body. It's not the Baptist body. It's not the Methodist body. It's not the Catholic body. It's the body of Christ. All right? You've got to join the body. How do I do that? The Bible says you join the body of Christ by submitting your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You become part of the whole body of Christ. In fact, 1 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 12 says, then you are baptized to the body of believers. All right? That you're baptized. Once you give your life to Christ, he puts you within his body. All right? Now you need to realize what your place in that fellowship, that local fellowship, that local church is, wherever it is, here down the street, I don't, but as long as it's a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, God-honoring, Jesus-exalting church that preaches the whole counsel of God's Word and chooses to structure itself according to the Scriptures, then you get in and you'll be a part. If that's here, we praise the Lord. But it first starts with your commitment to Jesus. Have you ever been born again? I see too many people trying to come to church and just reform, and it's, you're never going to find any peace. You try it. It's not working, is it? It'll never work because you have to submit your heart to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
And that starts with a surrendered heart. I say, well, what's the prayer? It's an attitude before it's ever a prayer. It's a faith. It's a commitment to Christ before it's ever expressed. The Bible says you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And then it goes on to say, then you can confess with your mouth what has happened in your heart by confessing Jesus is Lord over me. Then you get to be a part of that whole body that is exposing to the world around us that Jesus is Lord over all things, including us, and we stand as an exhibit of it. Give your life to Jesus today. If you're not part of a local church, I mean a real part of it, then find out where that is. If it's here, then come, join, be a part of what God's doing, saying, I need to be a part of a church that really preaches the truth and standing for truth. There's some out there, believe it or not, amen? A lot that aren't, but there are a lot that are. And if this is where, you, in your spirit, you feel God's leading you, then you come today, when we give this invitation, you guys can come as we prepare for the invitation. You come and come to one of the men who will be standing here in this altar and say, listen, I want to be a part of this fellowship. If you've never given your life to Christ, start with that. I need to give my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to come be a part of what God is doing here. I want to come be a part.